All right, let's get started with the second segment of today's lecture. And we have two topics here. The first one is this notion of graph abstractions of knowledge bases. And what does that mean? So what happens is if you have a um, knowledge base, which typically has been a CNF in our cases, and that's um, kind of the standard way of representing inputs, what you can do is you can construct a graph that kind of captures the structure of this CNF. And then by reasoning about the properties of that graph, uh, you can often provide guarantees on computational complexity. So let's say you want to take the CNF and compile it to a certain circuit type, let's say a DNNF or an SDD or an OBDD you can offer guarantees often on the time and space complexity of that compilation process, which Im implies also uh, a guarantee on the size of the tractable circuit by reasoning about the graph abstraction. Now, there are different types of graph abstractions. And I'm gonna now show you the uh, three common types. They are all pretty intuitive, but you have to realize that there is two dimensions to this game. The first dimension is how do I abstract the knowledge base into what type of a graph? And we're gonna see three of them now on this slide. And the second question is, what kind of a property of the graph do I use to offer guarantees? And there you'll also see different things, but we'll explain to you the one major property of a graph, which is known as tree width. But let's do the first thing, graph abstractions. The first kind of a graph abstraction is known as the primal graph. Pretty intuitive. What you do is for every variable in your CNF, you construct a node in the graph, right? So I have X, Y, Z, Q, those are my variables. And now, if two variables X and Y appear in the same clause, I put an edge between them, right? So the nodes are the variables and there is an edge between two nodes, if and only if those two variables appear in the same clause, X, Z, sorry, Y, Z, Y, Z. Pretty simple, right? Primal graph. Now, the other type, I will tell you what the name is, and maybe you can guess what are the nodes and what are the edges. The other kind is called dual graph. So, can you do you want to make a guess of what the nodes are in that type of graph? Anybody wants to make a guess? This is the primal graph. The nodes were variables and the edges represented interactions between these variables. I would have an edge when these two variables appear in the same clause like in there. Okay, someone is saying uh, we do the opposite, yes. Nodes are interactions, or in this case, clauses. So what I have here is one node for each clause, and then I have an edge between two nodes, that is, between two clauses, if they share a variable, right? So these two guys share this variable x, then I do that, and these two guys share this variable y, I'll do that. Um, that's the dual graph. And now there is a third type of graph abstraction. And that is known as the incidence graph. And in a sense, it includes both kind of representations. So what happens here is in the incidence graph, it's a bipartite graph. I have two layers, uh, one layer where we have nodes representing variables and another layer where we have nodes representing clauses and then I do have basically an edge from a variable to a clause if that variable appears in that particular clause, all right? So there is primal, there is dual, and there is incidence. And if you're talking about a property of a graph, which is known as three width, very famous, I would explain it to you in just a little bit. Then in a sense, you can offer three kinds of guarantees you can offer a guarantee based on the tree width of the primal graph or the tree width of the dual graph or the tree width of the incidence graph. 
So sometimes you'll see people saying incidence three width, dual three width, primal three width. But remember, just like you have different graph abstractions, there are different kind of properties of graphs. So I mentioned three width because very famous, it's been subjected to extensive study. There's something called branch width. There's something called path width, and these get used. We're not going to go over these various guarantees. There's a lot of them, but I just want to give you a sense of the abstractions, a sense of the properties, and a sense of these guarantees. I'll, I'll cite one at least, or a few of them uh, later, but I want you to understand the game. Now, these are not the only graph abstractions. There's another type, which is based on what people call hypergraphs. I'm curious, how many people have heard of hypergraphs as opposed to graphs? Anybody heard of a hypergraph, the notion of a hypergraph? Okay, apparently not. So let me show you an example. And this is an example of an abstraction based on hypergraphs. So a hypergraph is similarly, you have nodes. And in this case, we chose the nodes to be the clauses. And while in a regular graph, you have edges and edges connect exactly to nodes, a hyper edge can connect multiple nodes. Now, this is not a very good example because every hyper edge here, which is drawn as a bubble, is only including two nodes. But in general, this hyper edge could include multiple nodes. And what's happening in this case is if you look at these clauses, four of them, one, two, three, four, then the hyper edges correspond to variables. But the variable B. I would include in that, that hyper edge every clause that mentions variable B. Now, again, this was not a great example because there's only two clauses that mention the variable B. But if you had, let's say, another clause, let's make it five. And say here I have, let's say, V and C. Okay, Then this would be five, and that would be included in that particular edge. Okay, So in this particular case, you start talking about notions like hyper width and hyper tree width and so on. But let's just focus on these guys for now, all right? The primal, dual, and incidence graphs. And you can go and, and invent your own abstraction, right? Uh, these are the common ones. Now, let's talk about properties. And as I mentioned, when you look at a graph, there are different properties. People talk about uh, things like tree width, branch width, path width, and, and so on. Tree width is the one that has received the uh, most attention. And before I give you effectively a formal definition of tree width, let me just say all of these notions uh, of width are numbers. So I give you this graph and I say, what is the tree width of that graph? And then you come back with a number, two, three, 17, 100. And before we get into details, the main thing you need to know is those guarantees that people give uh, based on these notions are typically of the following form. Linear in the size of the problem and exponential only in tree width. They, they pretty much all look like that, which basically means if your graph abstraction has a small tree width or a bounding tree width, then you are in good shape. Now, it doesn't mean that if the tree width of the graph abstraction is very large, that you're in trouble. It just means that I can no longer give you a guarantee. Now, tree width is very famous and has been subjected to a lot of study in graph theory because it's one of these notions that you can intuitively think of it as trying to see how similar a graph is to a tree structure. A tree structure is a nice structure. It shows that things do not interact as much. And as you, your graph becomes more connected and deviates from being a tree, the tree width start going up and up and up. So in a sense, it is a measure of how connected your graph is. Now, there are different definitions for tree width. Perhaps one of the simplest, at least in terms of also giving you a sense of uh, this notion of measuring how connected the topology is, is based on the notion of a tree decomposition. Let me explain this in just a second. The idea is, I want you, I, I want to play a game with you. And based on that game, we'll decide what is the tree width of this guy. The game is, I want you to take this and construct something that I call a tree decomposition. What is this guy? It's a tree for one. And the nodes 
are labeled with sets of, so here I have A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Now here you can put more than one variable inside these bubbles, okay? So far, so good. And I'm, I'm going to put two conditions on you when you construct this guy. The first condition is for every edge here, like A, C, I want the variables A and C, that is the endpoint of edge, to appear together in one of these bubbles. These bubbles are usually called clusters, by the way. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six clusters. So I'm going to put two conditions on you for constructing this guy. One of them, for every edge, the two endpoints must appear. So let's say A, C, they appear here. Uh, let's look F, H, uh, F, H appear here. So you can check all of the edges and you'd see that this satisfies that criteria. There's one more criteria. The criteria is if a variable, let's say F, appears in two of these bubbles, here's F and here's F, right? It appears here, it appears there. Then I want it to appear on every bubble on the path between them. So F is here, F is here. It must appear between these two guys. Let's take another one. Uh, let's say D. Let's say D. D appears here and D appears there. That means it must appear on this guy, and it does. All right? And similarly, let's say A. A is here, and A is there. So it must appear on every bubble that sits between these two guys, and it does. OK, so these are the conditions. It's a tree. You make sure that the endpoints of every edge of the graph sit together in the same bubble. And if a variable appears in two bubbles, it must appear in every bu bubble on the path between them. Now, here's the game. The game is when you construct one of these guys, I'm going to say that its width is the size of the largest cluster minus one. Now, all of them happens to have size three. In this case, three minus one is two. But let's say this one of these guys had five variables. Then the width would be um, four. The question is, the question is, how easy it is, or what kind of 3D compositions are possible as far as width depends on how connected this guy. And we're going to define the tree width of the graph as the smallest width attained by any 3D composition of the graph. Now there's so many of these guys, and each one of them will have a different width. And we, if we if we manage to examine them all and find the smallest width attained by any, this would be the tree width of this guy, okay? That is one definition of tree width. It's kind of taking your graph and aggregating it into a tree structure while trying to keep the size of these bubbles as small as possible. There are other definitions, but I think this should do it. And this is the one that comes from graph theory, the kind of mainstream definition. Now, just to give you an example, I mean, you'll find PhD theses dedicated to this notion of tree width, uh, because people, for example, are interested in not only determining the tree width, and by the way, determining tree width is hard, is uh, NP hard. Uh, people are also interested in constructing a particular tree decomposition of smallest width, because a lot of these algorithms that I mentioned, they feed and they start by working on a tree decomposition. So this is not just a theoretical construct to define tree width. It is a data structure that many algorithms use. In fact, there are international competitions for constructing the best tree decompositions of graphs. There's a couple of them in the last few years. Uh, I think in Europe, in Austria, were organized by uh, some institute uh, there. So another question, how do we define the width? The width of this guy is simply, you look at the clusters and you look at their sizes and, and the largest cluster size minus one. This is not a great example because all clusters had the same size, three, three, everyone has three. So three minus one is two, okay? But if you had another cluster that had four variables, then the width would be three, not two, okay? And, and, and this is the uh, three width. Let me see what other questions do we have. No, you don't pick, you can put as many variables as you want in each bubble, as long as you satisfy the two conditions that I told you. For every edge, the endpoints must sit in at least one of these bubbles. And the other condition about if a variable appear in two bubbles, it must appear on every path between them. Okay, this is not meant to have you memorize or know all of the details of how this works, but this is meant to just give you a sense of what the game is. So this is three width and you can define other notions, as I said, like branch width, path width, but I want to mention two quick things before we go to guarantees. 
sometimes you define these notions like something like path width is defined on the graph abstraction and sometimes it's defined directly on the CNF. In fact, we've seen one of these guys before and I want to revisit this. We, we talked about the notion of cut width. We kind of hand waved there. Now I want to define two other notions. One of them is the cut width of a CNF and, and the other is the path width of a CNF. And here we're not gonna construct a graph explicitly, we're just gonna go do it directly. So you've seen this one before, let's just do it once more. And then it's sister notion path width is immediately after that. Here I give you a CNF and I tell you what is the cut width of that CNF. In a similar fashion that we did it for three width, where we used an auxiliary creature, the three decomposition. And I said, listen, there is the notion of a three decomposition and every three decomposition has a width and the best width attained by a three decomposition happened to be the three width. Same story here. There is an auxiliary notion, but that auxiliary notion is much simpler. It's a variable order. So to define cut width of a CNF, I'm gonna look at a variable order and define the cut width of that variable order. And we're going to see how now, it's very simple. And then I'm going to tell you, well, there's so many variable orders. There is a factorial of them. Each one of them has its own cut width. And the, the smallest cut width attained by any of these variable orders, that's going to be the cut width of the CNF. And that phenomena is all across, where when you're defining one of these graph theoretic properties, you have a secondary structure and then you define that property for the graph to be the best attained by those secondary structures. So let's look at this particular variable order and see what is the cut width of that variable order. We've seen this before. You can lay out your clauses like this. So this clause has one, two, three variables. So it's mentioning these three variables. This two, three is mentioning these two variables. You see what's going on. And now you define the notion of a cut where any anywhere between these variables, you do a cut and you see how many clauses cross. And in this case, three, four, and five, these are the guys that cross. So this is called the cut set at that point. Now you have different cut sets, right? Here's another one. So in this case, you have one, two, three, four, five of these cut sets. And, and if you look at this cut here, uh, those are two. Ah, this is wrong. This should be two and three. Okay. Well, guess what is the cut width of the order? The cut width of the variable order in this case is three, which is the size of the largest cut set. Okay, if you look at this cut set here, the size is two, this is two, this is one, this is three, and this is two. And then the rest, you know, the cut width of a CNF is the smallest cut width attained by any variable order. You see the pattern? The secondary structure here is the notion of a variable order, and I have so many of them, and the cut width attained by any of them, the smallest cut width attained by any of them, that would be the cut width of the CNF. And similar to three decompositions where algorithms usually start off by construct, constructing a three decomposition and using it, same thing here. Uh, those uh, compilations or results that are based on cut width, they usually feed off a particular variable order. So they're not only interested in computing the cut width of this guy, but they're interested in finding a variable order that has the smallest cut width because that will end up being the basis of how these algorithms uh, work. All right, now one more definition, which is the path width of a CNF. Now path widths can be defined for graphs. We're not doing this here, but it can also be defined for uh, CNFs and it's very similar to this guy. And let's see it, same structure, CNF, and I want to know what is the path width of the CNF. And then we're going to talk about the notion of a variable order being the secondary guy. And then I'm going to define the path width of a particular variable order. And then I'm going to say the path width of the CNF is the smallest path width attained by any variable order. Okay, it's pretty simple. The only thing that's left here is what is the path width of a variable order? In this case, what is the path width of that? Very similar. There is the notion of a cut, but instead of defining the notion of a cut set being those clauses, you know, these three, I'm going to look at the variables that appeared in these clauses and just happened before that, not after the cut, before. So this guy mentions the variables one, two, this guy mentioned the variable two, this guy mentioned the variable one, that's one and two. 
Okay, so remember cut set, I had clauses in here. In separator, I have variables. So let's see me see. Do I have another one? I don't. Uh, help me out here. Let me see if I do this here. What would be the separator in this case? Uh, I need variables. What would be uh, the separator in this case? Uh, give me variables. And people are saying, uh, remember, I look at these clauses that are cut through and I see what variables they contain before the cut. So for this guy, it would be V5, correct? Uh, let me, okay, no, I think people are saying V1 through V5, not correct. Look at this clause. This clause mentioned only V5 and V6. And, and the guy that's before the cut is five. So I do have V5. Let's look at this guy. This guy mentioned V4 v5 and v6 only two of them are before the cut four and five already have five so that is v4 no fantastic okay someone is already saying now four and five you see what's going on guys in cut width i would give you back the number in this case the number two because two clauses in in the um, path width i also give you two but because of these two variables. Now, here's where, where there's a difference between the cut, cut set and the separator. The cut set has three clauses, one, two, three, but the separator has only two variables. Okay, same story. Size of the largest separator. So separator, two, three, four, five separator. We check them one by one. The largest separator, that would be the path width of the variable order. And in this case, it happens to be three. Path width of the CNF is the smallest. Now, one question people ask about these notions is whether they dominate each other. And sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. So it happens that path widths and the cut width of a CNF neither dominate the other. Okay, if, if you want to read the formal definition of cut width and path width, I included these. These come from a PhD thesis of Umut Ostok, who graduated a few years ago from our department. And he investigated the subject quite a bit. He introduced his own parameters of graphs beyond what we talked about. But let's just wrap up this part here by giving you a sense of how you use this, right? So here's actually, this is table also from almost thesis and it's available online. So if you look at circuit types like DNNF, structured DNNF, deterministic uh, DNF decision, SDD, OBDD, and here's example of things people use to offer guarantees. Now you see here incidence tree width, that's the tree width of the incidence graph of the CNF. Primal and dual tree width, that's the tree width of either the primal graph or the dual graph. People gave guarantees based on that and so on. Now you can see, for example, SDD, tree width of the primal graph. OBDD guarantees based on the path width and the cut width of the CNF. In fact, we've talked about this before and we've seen why. And as I said, these guarantees are usually exponential only in tree width, path width, cut width. So if you end up having a graph abstraction that has a bounded tree width, then it's in good shape. If you happen to have a CNF that has a bounded cut width or path width, you're in good shape as far as compiling an OBDD. Here's an example of what the result would look like. Given a CNF with n variables, and size M, now size is measuring the number of clauses and their sizes, and incidence tree width, that is a tree width W of the incidence graph of the CNF. Then this bound tells you that you can get a DNNF circuit whose size is within this complexity. You can see linear in the size and exponential in tree width. Now, these are what we've talked about. There are other things, CV width, decision width, linear CV width, these were actually things that uh, were introduced in almost thesis. And some of these are better than those guys. They're more refined, meaning they represent abstractions that will lead to tighter bounds than what was known based on previous abstractions and pre previous graph theoretic things. So you could have really a few lectures on the subject, but I hope you know what the game is at this point. Two things, a graph abstraction and then properties of the graphs and primal dual incidence that capture us a lot. Tree width, path width, cut width also captures a lot. And, and we've already discussed these in details here, all right? But there's so much and so many more, but I hope this gives you a very good idea 
of what's going on. I'm pretty happy I did this because I've made the references to these things throughout the course. And in retrospect, we should perhaps mention this earlier. And just to let you know one last thing here. Now, remember, these constructs like a variable order or a 3D composition, they're not just useful for defining these notions. They end up being data structures that are used by these algorithms. And if you look at the new parameters that I showed in this table, they're also driven by new data structures. And you've seen some of those before. You've seen the notion of a V3. Now, we, we talked about a V3, okay, ignore these tags. We talked about the notion of a V3 as something that you have to construct so that you can um, construct an SDD4, but you can do a lot more with the V3. You can attach properties to it and talk about its width and then talk about the size of the SDD as a result of the properties that the V3 has. Uh, here's what happened is, in, in this case, uh, this is the CNF. And just to give you a sense of what kind of analysis happens there, there is a way to distribute the clauses of the CNF across the different nodes of the V3, and then you derive various properties, and then I can give you a guarantee. If you were to compile this SDD, SDD for this CNF, using this V3, I can give you a guarantee on its size and so on. Another related notion is called the D3, where uh, it's a Again, just like a, a V3, a full binary tree, except at the bottom, you don't have the variables, but you have the clauses. Okay, you see this duality. Here, I put at the, at the leaves, I put the clauses. Here, I put the variables. Again, you can do an analysis on this and attach various labels to its internal nodes and talk about its width and give guarantees. And both of these end up being data structures that also drive these compilation algorithms. Okay, once more, if we were to get into this business of these data structures, these graph theoretic concepts, and talk about the details of some of these advanced algorithms, uh, this would take us several weeks. And uh, this is something we couldn't afford in this course, but I hope you get to see what's going on here. And you should be able to follow this pretty easily now, given everything else that you know. But it would be an attractive subject for those who's into algorithms and complexity analysis. Pretty fun. It is intriguing, it is subtle, and it's impactful, right? So I think I'm gonna leave it at that. So unless there are questions, I'm gonna go to the very last topic, which we should be able to finish in time. So any questions? All right, I know we're covering a lot today, but that's the whole point. It is four topics uh, to help you complete the picture of what's going on. Now, let me get to the very last topic for today. And this is the notion of auxiliary variables. It looks like too technical, right? Auxiliary variables, how could this uh, be something significant? Something that will dedicate, what, about 15 minutes in the finale. It is a very important concept practically, practically and theoretically. And let me illustrate it intuitively first, and then we'll say a few things about this. Here's a knowledge base. It's a CNF over variables A, B, C, D, E. Let's say you're gonna do SAT on this. And here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna tell you, you know what? Before you do your work, I'm gonna take this guy and add some variables to it. Why would I do that? Well, because I'm gonna make it simpler as a result. For example, I'm, I'm gonna say, don't work with this guy, work with this guy. Wait a minute, what happened here? Suddenly there's a new variable X. Okay. It is simpler in the sense that this had one, two, three, four, five, six clauses, and this had one, two, three, four, five. So, okay, I, I made it shorter. But you say, what happened? What, what are you doing? Okay, I mean, yeah, five clauses instead of six, but what is this additional variable? And can I really work with this? Can I do sat on this instead of sat on that? Well, whenever you do this, whenever you add these auxiliary variables, and, and we'll say what their meaning is, you have to offer me a guarantee. So for example, you say, okay, this is smaller, great, but listen, I'm trying to do SAT on this. Well, then in that case, I have to tell you, these are equisatisfiable, meaning satisfiability test on this is exactly on that. So if this is satisfiable, this is satisfiable. If this is unsatisfiable, this is unsatisfiable. I have to give you that kind of guarantee, okay? Now, this is if you're doing satisfiability, but you may be doing something else like counting the models or trying to compile, then we have to offer you a guarantee. But again, there is a notion of, adding the auxiliary variable to simplify something, but I have to give you a guarantee that that doesn't hurt you. Well, guess what? 
there are different guarantees that people gave. The one we're going to focus on here is the following. And it's pretty simple. Let me show it to you. Think of this as a function over x variables. So x here is a, b, c, d, e. And the new guy is over the same variables plus more. So what did I add here? I added the variable x. So I'm going to say this is equivalent modula for getting to that if and only if the following. I started with this, I added these auxiliary variable. But if I existentially quantify these variables from that guy, I get back the original guy. So this is a general kind of guarantee that I give you on the new guy compared to the original guy. It captures a lot. If you look here, by the way, you will find if you take this sigma and existentially quantify the variable x from this guy, oh man, that's not a great sigma, you get delta. So the relation actually holds in this particular case. And where do you use this? Okay, I, I kind of hinted that you basically adding these variables will make your knowledge base simpler and therefore it will allow you to do work easier, but actually it's deeper than this. But let me just say a couple of things. Once more, the notion of what do you preserve varies. Could be preserving satisfiability model count, but we're gonna focus on this because this is in a sense quite general. And the work of taking a knowledge base and adding auxiliary variables is usually done by what people call preprocessors. So if you're doing it for SAT, people will say, okay, before you run your SAT solver, you know, apply this preprocessor on the input CNF, which will try to create something that now would be easier for SAT solver. Now, I'm gonna give you two applications of this next. Each will be explained by either a slide or two. And then I'm gonna mention at least the names of two techniques for adding these auxiliary variables. One of them, you must at least hear the name. It's so important. It's from 1968. But let's first talk about the first uses of this because it is very important theoretically. And that is the notion of extended resolution. This is a deep theoretical co concept and not as explored on the practical side. The basic idea is this. You know what resolution is. And a resolution can be used to construct what we call resolution proofs. So you have a knowledge base like this. And I let's say, let, let's focus on inconsistent knowledge bases. So I'm trying to show that the knowledge base is inconsistent. You can apply a resolution. You know what this is. And you keep doing until you get an empty clause. Now, we know of certain formulas or CNFs where the resolution proof is guaranteed to be exponentially sized. If you remember when we did resolution, we had choices. Oh, do I resolve this first? Do I resolve this second? Do I do this? Do I do that? Well, for certain things, every resolution proof, doesn't matter how you do it, will be exponentially sized. One of the well-known CNFs that has that property is known as the Pigeon Hall problem. And what people found out is there is a technique called extended resolution which is based on adding these auxiliary variables, which can, in some of these cases, lead to polynomial size resolution proofs. Now, before I tell you what extended resolution is, which is pretty easy, you have to understand what the significance of this is. If you're using a SAT solver to run on one of these CNFs whose resolution proofs are known to be exponential, what does that mean? That means the SAT solver, modern SAT solvers will blow up. Why? Remember, SAT solvers, when they find that an input is inconsistent, they produce a resolution proof as a side effect. Remember that discussion? So if the re resolution proof is exponentially sized, that means the set solver will explode on that. In some of these cases, extended resolution can lead to polynomial side proofs. So which means if I use it on the input CNF, then in that case, my set solvers will not blow up. Okay, so there is both theoretical and practical. The people in complexity theory care about the notion of exponential proofs versus non-exponential proofs. So what is this guy? It's very simple. It's very simple conceptually, but how to apply it in practice is another story. The idea is very simple. You pick two literals from the CNF, L1 and L2, and you add this. You're making the notion of L1 or L2 equivalent to X. That's it. And people have shown 
that if you selectively, of course, for some of these problems that have exponential proofs, if you add clauses like this, and you carefully choose your L1 and L2. Now, the important thing is this X should be a new variable, cannot appear in the CNM, okay? This is the auxiliary variable we're, we're adding. Then you can do a resolution proof that is now polynomial as opposed to exponential because you're using this guys. Now, this is not a clause, but this, this is written as these three clauses, right? You should know how to break this into three clauses. So you're really adding this to the CNF. Think about it conceptually. By introducing this, in a sense, I'm allowing you to resolve on two literals at once instead of just single literals like we've done in, in, in resolution. And apparently this simple technique can give you polynomial side resolution proofs as opposed to exponential ones. And you shouldn't be hard to convince yourself that after adding these guys to your CNF, if you existentially quantify X, everything goes away. So you do have that guarantee of uh, equivalence modular forgetting. Okay, this is one use of these. Where, where, where things are still missing is how do I add these? Because if you want to add these, you have to know which L1 and L2 to use. And this is not as explored as one would hope. And in some of these theoretical results, people handcraft, right? Pick these guys carefully and then show you that with these additional clauses, with these additional variables, now I can do significantly more efficient resolution proofs. Okay. I have one more application and I don't have time to talk about specific techniques for adding these auxiliary variables. I just wanna mention this one quickly. Site and transformation, this is a classic, all right? And all I can tell you about this is this is a technique that adds, tries to convert any Boolean formula or a circuit into a CNF without blowing it up. Now we've seen that you can always convert any Boolean formulas to CNF, but that process may blow up. And what this transformation does, it adds auxiliary variables and it guarantees you, you can always do this efficiently, but you're gonna get a CNF over more variables, but you still have the guarantee that if you existentially quantify these additional variables, you get back your original. And best way to explain transformation is if you have a circuit like this, and I'm interested in a, knowledge base that is in a CNF form. So what this guy will do is we'll add variables for every wire, X, Y, Z, W. And then you can start writing clauses that relate these local variables. So I can, in this case, if I end up giving names for each of these wires, I can construct a knowledge base in CNF easily. But now it's not only over these variables, it's also over these additional variables. But you get the guarantee that if you project that guy on these input and output, you get back your original thing. So this is in general meant to take any Boolean formula and convert it to CNF by adding auxiliary variables. There's something called bounded variable addition we're not gonna do. Let me conclude here in the last few minutes by one more application, very important for knowledge compilation. And one reminder, and then basically one slide, then we're done. The reminder here is existential quantification is easy on decomposable circuits, if you remember. Here's a circuit, it's both decomposable and deterministic, and, and I wanna existentially quantify X and Z. So as you know, we just replace these guys by true. So that's what happened here. And all, all, all literals over these variables get replaced by true. So that's easy. And, and we're gonna use this fact. The other thing you have to remember that if I had the decomposable and I forgot variables, I get decomposable. But if the original was deterministic, which in this case it is, when I do forget variables, I'm no longer guaranteed that determinism will be carried away. So fine. You start with decomposable deterministic circuit, you existentially quantify variables, guaranteed the result will be in this form, okay? We, we've gone over this before. Now, let's see this technique of adding variables. It turns out to be significant, both practically and theoretically. And we'll start with theoretically. You have an input CNF on these variables. I can show you, and people have shown, in fact, Umut has shown, that for some of these inputs, there is no deterministic and decomposable circuit that is compact that is every circuit that is decomposable and deterministic will blow up, will be at least exponentially sized. So what do I do? I can't compile these. 
But it turns out that if you take that input formula and in this case, add auxiliary variables and therefore get this guy. So now this guy is over X and some other guys. Now it's compilable. Now I can find for this guy a polysized deterministic DNNF. I couldn't do it for this guy, but I can do it for this guy. Now you tell me, okay, how does this help me? Anybody? I'm interested to compile this guy. I couldn't. I'm telling you, deterministic decomposable, no. Every one of these will explode. So I added auxiliary variables and I compiled. And then the question is, okay, what do I do now? I'm interested in a compilation for that guy. What do I do? Well, I just existentially quantify these additional variables. And I know this is easy to do in this case. I can existentially quantify these. The catch though is if I do quantify, existentially quantify the variables y, the catch is I'm only gonna get a DNNF for this guy, not a deterministic one, because I know forgetting only preserves decomposability but not determinism. So what happened here is, is I found a way to compile this guy by first adding auxiliary variables, compiling, and then existentially quantifying. And then you say, wait a minute, does this help? Well, yes, both theoretically and practically, and I'm gonna show you on the next slide and we're gonna end it there, but you probably have to realize that two things happened here. One of them is that we went and used this notion of adding variables as a surrogate. But something deeper happened here, which is this compiler is a compiler for deterministic decomposable. And at the end, I compiled my input to only something that is decomposable. So I use the compiler that is meant to do decomposable deterministic, and I kind of turned it into a compiler that only generates decomposable, not decomposable and deterministic. Now, this is a big deal. Why? Most of the compilers out there that people have invested in are compilers that do both determinism and decomposability. There is not much out there for only generating decomposable without determinism. In fact, if you remember our discussion about DPLL, which is used for top-down compilation, it's guaranteed to ensure determinism. So this technique allows you to capitalize on compilers that ensure determinism and turn them in a way into compilers that only give you decomposability without determinism. And that's a big deal because this is exponentially separated from that. Okay, guys, let's end it with this. Does this help theoretically? Yes. In fact, there are Boolean functions that are known to have exponential DNNF circuits, deterministic decomposable. And by adding a single variable Z, single one, then this guy end up having a poly size. So this is exponential for this guy, and this is poly size for that guy. Okay, that's a big deal. And you give me a function, says, no, you can't compile it. And I add one auxiliary variable, and now you can compile it. All right? And these are some numbers just to give you a sense, uh, these are two families of CNFs. And C to D is the compiler that generates deterministic decomposable negation overflow. That's from my group. And when you take this and, and apply C to D, you're trying to get this guy and doesn't work. And now you add these additional variables and then you use C to D first, but on the extended knowledge base with the additional variables. And then you forget at the end and you can see what happened things are unsolvable, become solved. All right. So I want to have our last slide to be a table with numbers. Let me put this beautiful visualization and end with this as one application of adding these auxiliary variables while offering this guarantee. Okay. If you want to get more perspective on the material that we uh, did in this course. Uh, there was a couple of papers that I did mention before and you may have gone over them, but actually it will be different now if you go over them. Uh, one of them is the uh, paper on the left, which is three modern roles for logic in AI. This is a recent paper from this summer. It was uh, presented as a tutorial at the POTS conference, which is the uh, main database theory conference. And you can think of it as an encapsulation of the things we talked about in this course, uh, but 
with all of the history references, the three roles here being computation, learning from knowledge and data, and the reasoning about the behavior of machine learning systems. Basically, you can think of this as an umbrella that covers all of the material that we covered in this course, and there's more there that we didn't cover. You'd see the pointers. The other article, which even puts this kind of direction of AI work that has this flavor in a broader context with everything else that's going on in AI, not just this, but other things, and, and look at the various developments in AI. One of them was just this summer, the other was just a couple of years ago on the cover of CACM. So um, if you want to try to internalize this material, especially that looks very different from other things that you may have looked at, if you've taken a pure machine learning course, or if you've taken a neural network course, these would be good articles to kind of help you consolidate all of this technical material and bookmark it in a certain way, as far as uh, putting it in a broader perspective about AI. Folks, we're done. That's pretty much all I wanted to say here. And um, I hope you found this useful and uh, I did enjoy it. It was the second online course under this COVID situation. And I wish you the best. Thank you.